Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the Radical Exchange Annual Conference. Our next session will be Innovations in Community-Focused Ownership. I'd like to welcome John Sirico to the virtual stage to begin. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining this panel, and thank you for those who have stayed up late uh, in the, on the Eastern Seaboard, and thank you for those tuning in early in Europe. Um, as as mentioned, this is the Panel Innovations and Community Focus Ownership. My name is John Sirico. I am a journalist and urban planning researcher who focuses on mobility and open space in our cities. So radically, radically rethinking property rights uh, is a key part of Radical Exchange's mission. It's also something that's confronting cities everywhere. Uh, as we know, the kind of models that we have right now, owning versus renting land, holding stock in a company, is a, are a bit outdated and have created a lot of the problems that we're seeing today in society. So today in this panel, we're going to hear from a, a couple of really smart guys, um, several entrepreneurs, innovative thinkers who are building new kinds of, of communities. Common to both of these panelists that are with me today uh, is a desire to think uh, and rethink property rights uh, and, and move past these kind of outdated models of ownership that we see today. So without further ado, let me introduce the panelists. Uh, what, what the structure will be is that we'll talk for a while. I'll have a, it's, a, it's a 50 minute long panel, so we'll talk um, through a couple of questions and I'll take some questions from the audience at the, at the end uh, for the panelists. So first, Yori Torfs. Uh, Yori is a freelancer and technologist. He's calling him from Belgium, from Antwerp. Uh, Yori is also the operational director of Quality of Life Initiative uh, or QOLEI, Q-O-L-E-I. Um, and that is um, aiming for frictionless person-to-person -person collaboration using a novel socioeconomic model whose goal is to increase quality of life for its participants by expanding their ability to adapt and self-manage in the face of life challenges. Um, Quoli is also leading the housing revolution, uh, Quoli Hops, which I will have definitely have questions about. And then we have Matt Dryhurst calling in from, Bel uh, from Berlin, um, a little close to Belgium. And Matt is a artist and researcher based in Berlin. Uh, his research focuses on technical and ethical protocols. He makes music and creates art with uh, Holly Herndon and their albums Proto and Platform 4 AD have provoked international critical acclaim. Uh, he teaches at NYU's Clive Davis Institute of Recorded Music, Strelka Institute and European Graduate School. Uh, he previously served as director of programming at Gray Area in San Francisco. And most recently he co-founded a podcast series, Interdependence alongside Holly. Um, so let me start with you, Yuri. Um, you know, tell me about what this means, friction to, frictionless person-to-person -person collaboration. What is the kind of approach Quality of Life Initiative is taking to community and ownership? Um, well, I think that the, the way we, we look at it is that if, if you're talking about uh, quality of life, um, it's, it's about empowering people. So people have to do it themselves. And this means we have to entrust them with responsibility to, to make it right for themselves. And, and so I, I think uh, the person-to-person society, the person -to -person society uh, can only go in, in that direction if you trust them really to, to do that. And to make collaboration obviously seamless because that's what you expect from a person-to-person -person society. Uh, I think I, in, if, if I'm allowed to talk a little bit in geek terms, because eh, I, I have a little bit <laughs> of an IT background, um, what, what, what I see is society as hardware. So, so I, I look at that as a layer where you have the economic and societal and industrial and cultural and all the things and the humans, uh, which are the hardware, in fact, you are working with, this is your material. But if you want really uh, people to be able to make uh, great and beautiful applications on top of this hardware, what you need is a very good operating system. Uh, you need something that abstracts the, the complexity of what's underneath. And for me, that is what, what the quality of life operating system is about. It's something that goes on top of uh, legal, administrative, economic, and even the human thing, and that enable you on top of it to build completely new uh, things and rethink it. So that's interesting. I'll definitely be returning to the hardware software uh, concept. And also, Yuri, feel free. Geek terms are welcome here, as always. Um, uh, Matt, let's talk a little bit about yourself. So I was reading that, you know, I read your column in The, in the Guardian. I think that gave a really good sense of your, your vision here. Um, so you're kind of taking this from the, the perspective of experimental music in the music industry. 
uh, and how it's kind of going to getting boxed out a bit by the the models we talked about before, different kinds of models of ownership, but I think they they overlap here. So, what kind of structures are you thinking to create, and and what are the fundamental problems that you see? Yeah, I mean, to to back up even just slightly, most of my research is based on. Um, critiquing the 21st or uh, 20th century notions of independence or the, the idea of the independent music industry is that you know irrespective of the style of music that you play um independence was this kind of uh, uh, uh wholesale romantic idea that that spawned in in the last century which basically suggested that you were you were free and, and available to to move outside of traditional structures um and I concluded that most of what we cherish from that legacy um, is actually the interdependence of, of, of stakeholders, right? Uh, um, so the artist means something because the album means something. The album means something because the label means something. The label means something because the city means something, right? Um, and all of these kind of uh, and a, a fetishism about the, inter the, the independence part um, has kind of helped to dismantle uh, many of these institutions, uh, institutions and, leave, and leave practitioners isolated. Um, so in a sense, we've kind of tried to do away with the gatekeepers of old because there's a lot of very famous stories about what was wrong with the music industry um, before. But but in essence, what we've done in over fetishizing the independence part is we've um, created new opaque um, uh, centralized structures. Like we've just created fewer gatekeepers that are even <laughs> even further away from uh, from public uh, from public scrutiny and oversight. Um, and so I've been trying to look at <clears throat> um collective ownership models um and also things like older older models maybe we'll talk about a bit later um such as guild uh guild or cartel economies um as a means to say well you know if we were to mount uh, any kind of an alternative vision which has always been a very very important part particularly when you're talking about arts um art structures and arts funding um what would that look like perhaps actually there's there's more lessons there looking at um uh, uh the the long legacy of guilds than there is uh, anywhere else on the market at the moment so going back to to the model you brought up uh yuri and, and matt i'm gonna ask you this question too what stands in the way of what you're trying to do what are kind of the obstacles that you face is it is it kind of you know government regulation public social perception what what are the obstacles here um, I think on, on, on our side, I think everything is an obstacle. Um, and, and so, and so that, that's why we, we uh, thought it was, uh, for us, it was not, uh, not an option to start building something that we wanted in the sense of it, exactly what you say, the interdependence aspect, the, the, the fact of guilds of people who are uh, involved in something need to have a say, not, not everyone who's not involved because who cares, you know? So in order to have that, uh, everything was an obstacle. Institutions are an obstacle. Um, uh, the, the, the way people, uh, uh, the, the basic emotions of people, are sometimes an obstacle. And and so and so, I, I, um, we thought that if if we wanted to give it a shot, um, we needed kind of a layer on top of this to to really abstract uh, parts of it. And and not not even parts of it, but but the the, the sheer context of of having an organization in order to uh, collaborate. Uh, is is already a hurdle. You know, you and I want to do something together. Let's let's grab a coffee and and start talking about it. And it has to go from from oh we're gonna do something very small to to possibly something huge. And why should there be at some point something oh now now we have to talk about shareholdership and who's say the most and and then and then all of a sudden it, it becomes crap and and the discussion is not about what it's a, what it should be about. It's it's about how you how do we frame what we want to do in a box. And 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 all my career, I've been uh, looking at ways of thinking outside of the box. And and at some point, I said, just let's just get rid of the box. We don't need the box anymore. <laughs> and and what about you, Matt? What do you see as the kind of obstacles uh, to this to this kind of revisioning this idea of of ownership in music? I think I mean, there's there's a few. Most of most of which are 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 non technical and more kind of discursive. I mean, one challenge with music is um, everyone in some sense feels some ownership over it because um, everybody has a relationship with music, and so oftentimes a pa passion can be confused for expertise. Um, similarly, when we talk about independence, um, many of the things that give music its um, sex appeal, so to speak. Um, have been the fetishization of the individual, 
right? And the idea that um, uh, the idea that uh, structures that support these things and make the individual and allow the individual to flourish um, are best left in the background. It kind of pollutes the story. Um, so the idea of thinking of, of of a subculture, for example, that could be considered uh, interdependent on like a very on like an infrastructural level um, is a is 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 potentially potentially new even though i think that there are some so, uh, some precedents there um the platform economy uh makes this quite difficult obviously in, in kind of siloing people's perspectives um uh you know operating within a, a communicate communication channels that are ostensibly advertising channels means that if you're working with a smaller budget it's it's hard to compete um which is why publishing in newspapers for, uh, and so on is 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 quite useful um and yeah, and, and generally the music industry, um, copyright, performing rights organizations, all of these um, organizations were largely designed for a different economy um, and in some cases are protected by state law. <clears throat> so for example, if you wanted to run a club, um, you must register with a performing rights organization uh, to, and, and, and it's very, very difficult to, to, uh, to negotiate some kind of other, uh, other alternative um, possible, but, but 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 um, not not uh, not very easy, um, and so I think the uh, you know, potential um, salves to this are also thinking on this on collaborating with the state, um, seeing seeing ways to work with public infrastructure um, and getting more artists and, and, and musicians involved uh, with public infrastructure projects. Um, as a potential means to kind of uh, 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 yeah find find it some somewhat of a feasible pathway. You know, I want to ask you this, Matt, and and URLs. I'll go back to you as well. But since you mentioned this, Matt, uh, with the platform companies, and I, I know you mentioned uh, companies like Spotify and the and the Guardian column that you wrote, um, is you know if if the response to that is also something based on technology in some way, and we know that this tech that exist, these kind of platform companies can be exploitative to some, to some extent. Uh, yeah. How can we ensure that our responses to these new, to these new models of ownership are not also, you know, exploitative to some sense or, or using tech in a way that's infringing on people's, you know, personal liberties, privacy, you know, all the criticisms you hear of, of big tech nowadays. In, in the sense, I think, my problem area is actually slightly insulated from this um, because the the dominance of stream financialized companies such as Spotify who haven't really yet turned a profit but but have raised exorbitant amounts of money um, the dominance is as such that uh, it, I don't believe that presenting some kind of novel technical solution even though I have done a lot of research into potential options there I don't believe that that would be the thing that would help people deviate um, their behaviors or purchasing power or whatever um, from from the service. Ultimately, this is a a, a conceptual problem. Um, it's a it's a it's a matter of education. It's a matter of um, principles. It's a matter of uh, yeah understanding and caring about the the communities that you are contributing to. Um, and so, in the short term, I'm not overly worried about. A, 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 I'm not overly worried about about the tech exploiting anybody. Um, I do think, though, that pointing out ways in which the current infrastructures are, often case silently, um, taking advantage of people is very beneficial to help pull people over to a different vision, right? And so, for example, one of the things I've been looking at is with performing rights organizations um, and the club economy, for example, um, ways in which previous structures are completely unfit um, for, for purpose. And solving that problem may, in fact, involve um, some tech. But the idea ultimately is that if you can bring people's minds over, then they will have some oversight um, to protect against against such exploitations, right? And 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 naturally, any any guild based or or cooperative based uh, solution that I might be interested in would have that democratic oversight built in from from get right. So um, so yeah, but it's it, it's a worthwhile it's a worthwhile question. But in in my particular uh, uh, circumstance. I am agnostic as to what uh, technical solution might appear. Uh, it's mostly a conceptual issue. Sure. And and Yuri, to you, that's the that same question. How do you make sure that the tech you're using in your platforms or your and your new your new models of ownership uh, don't box people out? 
you know, how can we ensure that that, that doesn't happen if it's well, something that's tech heavy? Okay, so uh, it definitely resonates. And, and I think the, the solution is not in tech at all. Um, uh, I think the, the solution is in, is in the, the way in which we, uh, uh, as humans, uh, take it and our involvement and our participation. That is that's the key to everything we do. And, and I think the, the, uh, one, one of the things uh, Matt talks about is that for me, for example, the negotiations with the state is something that, that is done on operating system level because nobody cares actually, as long as you have the legal authorization to do stuff, but nobody, nobody is interested in having that legal authorization. So that for me is very much something that's on the operating system level. And once that is abstracted, then you get people, individuals or group of people starting to do new stuff and the major thing that that was in the way for me to realize to really be able to uh, to do something with that is the concept of ownership as if as, as it is really embedded in society now and for me there was a, a a crucial thing that we needed to pull apart so you have in the ownership thing now you have uh the the value thing that is um that that's what it's worth to me and you have the control thing uh which is oh and i'm able to do whatever i want with it and I think for us, the, one of the key things we, we had to do to really uh, be able to abstract all these layers is pull them apart. And for us, value is something that is always held by humans and, and it goes from one human to another and, and it's in function, the more you participate, probably the more value will, you will acquire and that's okay. Control on the other hand is, is really, if you're involved in something, if you have something to say and because, because you really need it and that's much more, like Matt said, the guild aspect because guilds are, group of people doing similar things coming together deciding on how it should work and, and in that in that um, uh, perspective for me uh, the operating system in order to not be uh, controlling um, for me it's more like um, traffic regulations you know yeah, we we can we can do whatever we want we can go wherever we, we like to go uh, as long as we agree that when it's red you don't cross the street and it's when it's green you cross because that, that otherwise you have chaos so that's that's the level at which i think the operating system should function and more uh the the, the second uh, essential thing that we needed to add is um i i wouldn't trust myself to build something like that because <laughs> because i'm a human and i have my my fear and my greed and and my all all those nasty stuff that will come in the way so so the only thing to make an operating system that is that is truly there to serve people and that not creates a new institution because that's the real the, the one thing that we want to get rid of uh, is to make sure that the operating system is like evolutionary and also controlled by the people using it so if you're using it then you get a say and you get to control it and it's not one person there can never be one person or a group of person controlling this thing because then then it then then it will probably go to hell as all the rest did so so the the and and i, I must say and and uh, i'm not willing to go into too much of the of the legal uh, and and the, the very technical details but this is something that that was if, if you talk earlier uh, john about about the, the troubles we had really creating something that where responsibility to create it is then offloaded to the bigger purpose and so on is something that's legally it's very very difficult and, and hard and so we struggled with it for years before before we got it in a version that's kind of uh, doable to to really start uh, experimenting with it in in the real world and and yuri i'm glad that you and matt have been talking about guilds and other and other kind of you know throughout modern history we've seen these kind of forms of of alternate alternative ownership models come up guilds being one of them i think uh but what what has inspired you what kind of historical precedents um inspire something like the quality of life initiative what have you kind of looked to for inspiration um the, uh, that I think that's very that's very difficult to say for me. Uh, I'm I'm not I'm not very much of an uh, historian, <laughs> um, but but I've done lots of crazy stuff in my life, and and it's probably uh, the accumulation of of the struggles I've had um, being um, a manager of of the companies, uh, owner, startup uh, entrepreneur, and and the struggles I had with with ownership, with uh, shareholdership, with co ownership, with all the. the all the mess that it's done and where you have people really thinking about the good um with good intentions being drawn back to to the let's say the dark side uh by by this fear and this greed of losing something that they possess um getting getting uh let's say looking at a company like it's your your 
your kid, your child, like it's something real. That, that is something that really uh, I felt mesmerizing and, and, and that probably shaped uh, a little bit. And also I, I was born with a, a, uh, an absolute hate for uh, authority. So that might have helped as well <laughs> um, to, to, to really think about how can we structure ourselves without uh, being structured because I, I trust people are really able to. And I'm not saying everyone wants to be a leader because that's something that, that is very flexible and fluid. Uh, but but and that and that has to be some sometimes you're a leader sometimes you follow that that's perfectly okay, but but I think you you need you need you don't have to be in boxes in order to to be able to do that. There's not really an historical context for me. Yeah, you're as a as a long time freelancer myself. I feel like um, yeah, your 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 line about about your kind of life struggles. I feel the same way that you know being a freelancer. I've been involved with so many different forms of ownership myself and different projects that you kind of feel like you're setting your own precedence <laughs> in a lot of ways. Um, so uh, Matt, with you, uh, same question, just about historical precedence. I know in music, there's, there's been a history of, of different kinds of forms of ownership. Yeah, I mean, that's that's definitely one. I think like one obvious one in a sense is is I'm critical of the legacy of independent music because I love it, right? Because it's it, it's a very actually special uh, legacy and special precedent to say that, you know, through developing kind of ethical protocols and different ways to do business, um, you can build an entire splinter industry, right? We, the, we've already demonstrated that can be done. And I think actually the independent music industry as, as a model for things to come was incredibly influential. You know, at, at some point, I think 40% of the UK music industry were, were independents in a very short period of time from, you know, people starting to print their own records. Um, and so I, I think that's, that's an incredible inspiration. I just think you kind of need to do the same thing today, um, factoring perhaps the streaming economy or the platform economy as the major, so to speak. Um, and the other side, I guess, uh, to go back to, um, to the guilds is, you know, basically uh, guilds, I look at uh, precedents such as like the Hanseatic League, for example, um, the ability to, you know, for a member-based organization to collect their own taxes, um, to fund uh, fund common resources, um, gather enough influence to collectively bargain. I mean, the Hanseatic League went a bit further and they had their own armies. <laughs> I don't, I'm not quite, not quite uh, wanting to push it that far. Um, but you know, but what 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 ends up happening when you have these uh, these guilds is ultimately, um, you have resiliency, right? And we've seen. Um, we'll we'll talk about this maybe in a little bit, but particularly when it comes to music communities of, 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 of purpose, um, the idea of having some kind of structure that is not subject to the whims of financialized platform economy, ad platform, so on and so forth, is increasingly becoming more and more essential. And I think also to speak to what you guys were just saying related to freelance life or entrepreneurial life, I think that the idea of guilds or member-based organization also gives people a path um, and an identity, right? Um, there's a, there's a particular cruelty, I think, to the fetishization of independence, which is this idea that, you know, you and your laptop, um, you know, you your laptop and your Twitter account um, are free to float, like go afloat in the open sea of the web and need to hustle. Um, you know, if, if it's not working out for you, then you just need to hustle a little bit harder. Um, and I think uh, for anybody and an increasing you know, percentage of us um, in various different capacities feel this feel that we may have been cut adrift from from institutions that used to be able to provide some kind of security purpose and identity um, I think ideas like guilds or member-based organizations can really re will be very very attractive for exactly that purpose and you're already seeing this for example in the states with a lot of in music specifically um, a lot of music journalists uh, unionizing um, a lot of uh, uh, artists, in fact, denizens of the streaming economy, um, <clears throat> seeing themselves as workers for the first time, right? Um, looking and saying, well, why are we struggling right now when Spotify's, uh, you know, Spotify's uh, stock price just went up a billion dollars, right? Um, and so I think the identity part, again, is is beyond any kind of uh, any technical infrastructure. The identity part is is maybe the most inspiring and, and most motivating thing to to abstract away. Yeah, Matt, I'm, I'm glad you brought up resiliency. I'll, I'll be asking it very shortly because I, I have a question about that as well. But yeah, I, I think it's we're seeing that happen in my own field of media and, and journalism. You have I have so many close friends who are starting subscriber models and starting newsletter models because 
frankly, you just can't trust that you're going to stay at a big media outlet anymore for a long time. And you kind of need to break away from that a bit. So you're saying this, yeah, and I, I, I'm happy you brought up the unionization point because I think that's a key one. Um, to your point, I wanted to ask you, and, and Yuri, I'll come back to you as well with this question, is just what do you see as the future of ownership in your field? Do you see this model that you're proposing as being able to coexist with, with private ownership or, or, or something as big as Spotify? This is where I'll be disappointing is that at least in the areas I've been looking at, so specifically the idea of getting artists paid, um, uh, Holly and I later will be giving a presentation on our work in machine learning, which, which dives into the necessity for this kind of stuff is ultimately I'm actually in my field, very skeptical of any proposal that talks about doing away with private ownership, irrespective of the fact that I am very critical of the history of IP and very familiar with it. Um, the idea ultimately is that in the short term, when you have large financialized entities and 70% of profits in the music industry going to the top 1% of artists, the idea of doing away with, you know, a small artist's ability to uh, lay claim to their work um, and pursue it and pursue any kind of infraction of, on the, of, on, of their work um, uh, legally um, ultimately isn't, isn't all that helpful for the time being. Um, that being said, I think that like there are certain proposals that I've worked on in the past that under some kind of a guild structure um, or just collective structure um, could be quite useful in ameliorating what we understand IP to be, namely enshrining in a protocol the idea that you know you do not need to necessarily administrate um, for very very small amounts of money, right? You don't need to incur bureaucratic costs. Um, for a check of one dollar or something right and that in actuality under some kind of a collective structure if a hundred thousand people are earning a one dollar check maybe the that hundred thousand dollars um, would be better spent on a common resource that would endure over a long time than small payouts um, stuff like this i think changes the nature of ownership and the nature of remuneration for ownership um, and the other thing too is is you know enforcing this idea that you know, uh, anybody ought to be able to use something up until the point where they start making profit from it, right? Which is, it, uh, it's very tricky in, in different instances, like thinking about the DJ economy, for example, one of the things the protocols I've been working on ultimately is saying the DJ economy, which used to be pretty much a logic of, you know, a DJ is willing, uh, free to go and make money from the work of others because ultimately there's promotional benefit to the artist and ultimately that might lead to more sales. That's changed. And so one of the, the ideas I've been working on that's actually been gathering a lot of ground is this idea of saying that, no, under a guild model, as long as you can provide some advantages to DJs for being members, um, we could, in fact, as a means of collecting taxes ostensibly, um, take portions of profits made from live performances and distribute those back to the people who created the work and maybe use aspects or small amounts um, of that money to also fund pool of common resources, right? So the, the 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 kind of galaxy brain big idea there is being like, well, you know, how if if money was more fluidly and equitably shared, how many clubs could be funded from the uh, from the uh, 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 the fees that are being made by the top earners um, within this community? Yeah. So so there's 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 all kind of different ways I think you can play around with how we deal with ownership and deal with re remuneration. Um, but for the time being, I think we actually get closer to a post IP reality by really taking IP seriously um, because we need, we need some kind of relative parity. Um, this is my kind of like gripe with most libertarian principles like this is that they're great. You know, they're great if you, if everyone was equal tomorrow. <laughs> um, but ultimately we need to get to some sort of parity before it doesn't just turn into pure exploitation. Yeah, Yuri, I see you nodding your head a lot. It seems like, uh, yeah, yeah, it's fascinating though, Matt. It's especially the, the the DJ example. I think is great. Um, uh, Yuri, yeah, nodding your head a lot. What do you have to say about in your field in your your respective field, the kind of future of ownership and whether whether private ownership can can exist coexist with with quality of life. Yeah, I think, and, and I was indeed uh, nodding a lot because because I, I I don't know that much about the music industry, but but I I don't think you need to know a lot about all the other industry because we are all kind of uh, going through the same um, 
uh, industrial process that 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 uh, that affects us all. So so I think that that's why I was uh, I was nodding a lot. But I, I think that the the main uh, thing we are we are able to achieve with with the the, the way in which we take it is that we kind of get, uh, we can we can kind of Trojan horse the system. Um, since since we we're not a threat because we're just uh, working in the current context we're not trying to change it we're not trying to uh, get rid of ip or or whatever uh, other uh, rights of uh, of ownership of whatever you have that they're there just leave them where they are but but uh, make sure that they're not a problem anymore the, the second step to trojan horse is to make sure that the people that are uh, very that have a lot of interests now that that they are still involved they're not the bad guys it's not because you're successful that you're a bad guy if you're just like successful that's cool for you it's good so um let's let's build a better world together because it, it doesn't have to be bad for you it's, it's just it's not because it's better it's, it's the same for you that it's that it cannot be better for us you know so so i think there there are ways to collaborate even with the people who are at this point having a lot of uh, interest to really bridge the gap and and get them over to work in our system because in in the beginning it's not that different from what they have now so so yeah it's still the same oh let's do your thing because now i have a purpose so that's even better <laughs> so now i'm rich and i have a purpose so that's cool and and then and then you get to a point where where hopefully you you get enough traction in this new way of thinking that all of a sudden the old systems start to shake a little bit on his on his on his uh, foundations, and then you get to the point where you open the Trojan horse and all the things. So maybe you talk, we're, talk, we're talking about history earlier, but that, I think that's a history, <laughs> historical historical. I wanted to add something just quickly there, Yuri, because I I, I actually point. really I I really agree with you. Um, and yeah, and specifically on, for example, the DJ uh, question. Um, this is what I like about profit sharing models: is that ultimately I want for DJs to make as much money as possible so that they are able to share as much wealth as possible with the people who create the music that they play. And I think exactly that kind of attitude is, is a very generative and progressive attitude, right? Is ultimately, I don't want to give everybody a haircut. I want people to go out and thrive. However, I want, uh, I want for sufficient or equitable uh, uh, portions of that to be shared with the people who, who have a stake in it. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And that, and it, for me, it's all about alignment, alignment of, what as a group you're trying to achieve and and if you can and for me that that's where the guilds come come in and i think the guilds for me and that's why i, I want to make sure that 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 i'm on the same page here that for me at no point an institution will be able to possess stuff because once you get an institution owning things then all of a sudden it becomes it, it has a life of its own and it starts thinking about an, uh, as an institution and wants to preserve itself and wants to control other things and so uh, because we we uh, completely um, make that as a, a really a fatal hardware flaw if you apply that to the operating system it makes that ownership of stuff is always in the hands of people that that can uh, decide to put it together and realize great things but at no point are you forced to stay to have your ownership or at no point is the ownership coming to life on its own and forming some kind of a, a very ugly thing and i think that's that's one of the the things we have to uh, to be there and in order to organize this uh, let's say to to make your uh, very specific uh, traffic uh, regulation uh, for for a specific um, uh, industry that's for me where guilds come in where, where you have people of the same interest trying to decide on what's fair to do and what's not fair to do. And that would be, in, in a sense, when, when, when do we think it's commercial and when don't we think it's commercial? And it's not about, it's not about uh, winning or losing. It's about finding a middle ground that's, that's kind of good enough for everyone to accept. And I think that's, that's the place where, where most, most of us uh, will be able to thrive in our own thing respecting kind of the the very loose regulations that are not impairing our, our personal freedom or our freedom as a group but still making sure that all groups kind of evolve in uh in in a in a way that that does not um uh, for me it, it it can never be uh, about i'm winning because you're losing it has to be i'm winning because you're winning or so 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 and i think that's really uh doable and so the last question I kind of had before I wanted, because we're getting a lot of great questions from the audience and I want to get to them uh, immediately because a lot of them uh, pertain to everything we've been talking about here. Um, I wanted to ask, going back to Matt's point about re resiliency, because uh, I think we're all thinking a lot about uh, coronavirus and what's going on right now in the world. 
Um, for me, the biggest reference point has been the 2008 global financial crisis uh, as this sort of paradigm shift that was quite similar. But I think that we often forget that the 2008 global financial crisis, while it definitely dismantled traditional structures to a certain extent, it also ushered in all these new huge powers of concentration. I mean, we have we didn't have Amazon's kind of tentacles all over things as much as we did before 2008 or, or Spotify with Matt, things like these big platform companies. But with coronavirus, you kind of have this situation now where it is once again, not only showing us that these models are incredibly uh, in resilient to change. And like, you know, you're seeing the rental market like falling into itself right now. Uh, I was just reading about the clubs in Berlin and what that experience is like right now. I think it was in FT did a great article about the club experience right now. And, you know, these people, that, you know, these industries that are getting battered uh, and, and having a hard time stay afloat. And I think the other lesson to contend with here is that we now know that clearly this is going to keep happening, right? We know that there's going to be either another pandemic or or something of, of a similar kind of scale that we'll have to contend with and deal with. So I want to I wanted to get both of your opinions just in your respective fields. What coronavirus has made you think about? Has it changed your kind of views of what ownership should be? Um, and and how do you think people's minds might be changing? So Yuri, I'll go to you first, then we'll I'll come back to Matt on that. Uh, yeah, definitely. Uh, for me, what, what we saw in the, in the, the Corona uh, crisis is uh, is really people coming together and having and having really uh, initiatives, um, uh, local initiatives, having way more success than governments trying to get a hold of masks, for example. Uh, so so um, uh, people in in their home saying, okay, well, I'm, I'm going to create some and I'm going to make some and and I'm going to share them and and so on and so forth. So you see that it that the entrepreneurial spirit of people and and the way in which if it really matters to them they can really get out there and do their thing that that is something that that um for me uh um, strengthened me in the idea that what we have to do is really enable them to do so because now it's still if you want to do that oh yeah then then you're kind of a non-profit uh, uh or whatever you know it's like on the fringe and it, there's no way we're going to let you play with the big boys if you're like just doing this because you like to do it and because you want to contribute and i think for me it strengthened me in the idea that that if we create uh this operating system on top of society and those people out of their their passion out of their energy all of a sudden become capable of doing this but also make make it uh, better for themselves so really work on their eight life domains instead of only contributing and, and being uh, um, uh, towards the community and so on then then i think we're, we're going to see very beautiful things uh, happening so for me it strengthened me in that in the idea that we really can trust people to take the right decisions because those are the ones impacted in the end the, the government it's no one, you know, the central bank. That who, who is that anyway? So you, the, the people, those are the ones who who, uh, who need to eat every day. And so we need to get this power and and the way in which people are able to sense the tensions and change them. We need to take this back to them and and trust them with the fact that they will make the right decisions when time comes. Yeah, I think that's a great point, point Jorn. I think that what we're seeing, the, co- the institutions that have been the slowest are not the small players. They're actually the bigger players that have been the most sluggish to adapt and also are getting hit the hardest by it. Uh, Matt, and same to you, same point about what coronavirus has you has you thinking about and uh, about the future. Yeah, it's funny. I, um, I, I'm certainly not one to say that COVID has in any way validated any work that I've been doing. But the one thing that um, I think helps in a sense is that a lot of the the a lot of my modeling was thinking about impending climate uh, policy changes. So the idea that, sadly, border restrictions, cheap travel, the bar for touring artists was going to raise, um, and COVID has no doubt accelerated kind of a, a dress rehearsal of that scenario, right? It's very, very difficult to tell right now what the actual fallout will be. I mean, that being said, there's reports coming in from the United States that, you know, 90% of independent music venues may well close as a result of this. So everyone's kind of just waiting a little bit. And I think that's the most prudent thing to do. Um, but the one thing I will think is, will say is that, um, you know, what we have seen uh, brutally in some cases is that, you know, when people get off the hamster wheel of subsistence hustling, you know, and the platform economy and the budget airline economy, um, very, very few working artists have the assets sufficient to survive even a minor crisis, right? And so in a sense, this makes the prophecies of, of, of the streaming and the app economy of the 10s, you know, which is 10 years old, it's 10 years mature, um, 
look about as bankrupt as I as I've kind of long thought um, uh, long thought it was right is that we've had ten years of of reforming the journalistic industry, the music industry, the arts industry. Um, in the image of these platforms. And then when a crisis hits, um, it's very, very clear to see who is resilient and who is not, right? And so while in music, we now have to endure the indignity and in journalism, no doubt, the indignity of saying, okay, well, you're, kind of, you're, you're basically on your own. Um, think of another field in many cases. Um, you know, the, 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 the platforms that, that we used to, to communicate and that reordered our industries are doing better than ever, right? Like I was talking to uh, someone yesterday talking about how much money Bezos, for example, is how much more money Bezos is making per day now. Um, and so I think that like, this makes resiliency a real question. I have to concede myself, I've always been interested in the topic, um, but it's only recently that it feels very real. And I think it will feel very real to a generation of people, right? Um, this idea, and, and when you mentioned, you know, the 2008 financial crisis, uh, it's it's hard not to mention that with, without mentioning something like Occupy, right? Like th this idea that all of a sudden memes appeared, such as the one percent, that haven't gone away and they're sticking. And I think that the in terms of uh, in terms of, uh, of of the resilience resiliency narrative, there's a lot of people. Fortunately, myself, I, I consider myself to be quite fortunate to not be uh, hit as hard at this. But I know that there's a lot of people who won't forget the uh, the distances and the stratification of experience. Um, of this right and so resiliency as a concept itself i think people are, are going to take way more seriously and i can report from at least the scenes i'm familiar with these alternative ownership models these alternative uh, ways of doing business all of a sudden feel very real to people the the the, the amount of interest it's like tenfold interest all of a sudden. overnight people i was disagreeing with all of a sudden they're saying hey like what can we do um so, so in a sense, that's encouraging, but that's a silver lining on a on a very a very dark cloud, sadly. Yeah, yeah, I think that's a great point. I think it, it exposes just uh, how little the little amount of people that have a rainy day fund just kind of lying around, and also, uh, you know, I think everyone else who who has that rainy day fund seeing how you know, wow, you know, society really is living from paycheck to paycheck in a lot of industries, yep. and the minute this hits. Um, all right, let's get to some questions from the audience. We have ten minutes left. I want to get to a couple of these. Um, great questions here, and this conversation has been awesome. Uh, let's. So I have a question for you, Yuri, um, from Grace. Uh, her question is: You said that you took a long time to develop the model of ownership and management. Please give us some details on what you created and how others can implement it. Um, <clears throat> then, then I think the the main thing we've created is a is a way to not have to create it, um, and uh, I, I know that's that's very abstract, uh, and and it would it would take us way too far uh, to go into the real details. Um, I, I would I would suggest just contacting me, and um, I'm, I'm very passionate about it, so so I will I will talk with great pleasure about it. But I think the main thing we wanted to do is to have something that's really based on evolu evolutionary principles so that whatever we created uh, at the core, it, it, it would not be able to be controlled by me or us or whatever. Uh, so the, the main thing is that there is something that enables uh, the abstraction of, of uh, in, in our, in our uh, concept, for example, the, the abstraction of the concept of a, 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 a company or a co uh, a corporation or something so that you don't have to use that anymore but you can still uh, use what it what it enables um and and so you can use still have the value you can still uh, uh transact you can still do all the things you do but you you will not be able to name it for for example uh, companies in our models are just abstract numbers they, they have no name because they shouldn't have because they, they go away when people don't use them anymore they, they're just there to facilitate um uh, 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 the the applications and the, the beautiful things people build on top of them, and and so I think it's creating that thing that that is that is what took us most of the time, um, but but it's 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 very uh, boring uh, administrative legal uh, and tech thing, and and to be to be clear we're in very early stages, so so we we've built enough to be trying out our our first experiments, uh, but we're um, we not <laughs> there to to be a, a global thing. Uh, so so, and I think that's what I like about it is because because it's evolutionary. Then you just start building, and and if it doesn't work, you fail, and then you you change some stuff, and you can you carry on. So it's not it's it's very resilient in that sense. It, it's it's not it's just there because people are using it, and if they're not, well, then it's not there anymore. <laughs> um. 
yeah so i yeah that's a that's that's a good point and i feel like um I, I got another question that's kind of a pushback because uh, you mentioned the, the tech point you're in. I, I want to. I got another question that's kind of a pushback to my point about uh, something being tech heavy. Um, is how could you even engage with this conceptual notion of of community ownership if it isn't a tech enabled tool? Uh, and I, I I'm interested in getting your opinion on that, Matt, because um, I know you had a bit of a couple of thoughts about the tech the tech question I had and 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 trying to and you know staying outside of that framework but if it isn't a tech enabled tool how would people engage with this this new model well I'm, I mean there's there's a you know there's a long history of of co-ops at least here in Europe that in many cases are, are supported by and protected by law um uh, I'm very amenable to you know digital guilds DAO models these kind of these kind of things but ultimately you still do have this issue of kind of a a decoupling of like conceptual ownership and like legally protected ownership and i know there's some people working on on that stuff um and so yeah in a sense like the 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 tools necessary to build stuff like this in different jurisdictions uh do already exist that being said i do agree that, that it's a missed opportunity to not take full advantage of of a new suite of tools right that's a, a um, um my only my only point is to say that I think that oftentimes, and this is this is more in my space than, than I don't know if, if this applies to all spaces, but oftentimes you'll often get more attention for proposing a novel technical solution to something than you will for simply um, addressing something uh, conceptually or speaking to the, the principle of the matter. Um, and so I've often in the past ended up kind of leaning on or overemphasizing in a sense um, the tech behind something because people people get excited by that we've been kind of tra conditioned to get excited to say oh well this app's going to change everything right um and and i do actually think that there's some there's some truth to that there, there are some wonderful uh novel uh applications to this new stack of, of the decentralized web for example that i find very exciting but i'm actually trying to walk it back a little bit um because ultimately as i say most of these problems are conceptual problems and i don't care if they get solved on paper you know that that like if you if they get solved with paper mache I'll be stoked, right? Um, and I think starting with that principle and then building up with, as I say, democratic oversight, community oversight, is the best possible solution. But I'm not, I'm not anti-tech or a tech skeptic at all. In fact, I, I I'm, I'm so enthusiastic sometimes that I have to hold myself back, and that's one. <laughs> yeah, I think yeah, yeah, blended kind of approach. It seems like uh, where it's pro-tech but also a, a weary of kind of tech's limits. It seems it seems most sensible. Um, Yuri, I wanted to get this point from you because um, I know that quality of life has a housing component to it. Uh, how interoperable, like how transferable are these corporate models that you guys are talking about? Can you, can you, how can we set them up in other industries? Or is it something that like quality of life, for example, is it something that you could just see in a housing context or can it be spread elsewhere? Yeah, uh, it, it can be spread spread elsewhere, uh, but that's that's where the growing part uh, also comes in. Um, just to, to link it with, with the, the topic of tech, uh, I think for me, tech is not only uh, software. Tech is, the software is definitely a part of technology, but you have all the, the social field where, where you learn how people work together. And this is also tech for me. So, so you have to those mechanics and, and you have the whole legal structures. This is also tech for me. So, so the tech stack for me is a, a really stack that takes the whole society thing as a whole. And, and for the, the, the models, um, to be transferable, they they you have to you have to have your operating system operational. Uh, unfortunately, still in a very local area. So so for us, for example, we are now majorly in the EU uh, with our first initiatives, but but we have uh, things like um, a coffee and cocktail truck um, uh, a group who who does um, uh, coffee and cocktails and and uh, who brings. Um, work to uh, remote places and, and, and social interaction and, and, and stuff like that. So, so this is one of the, the initiatives we're onboarding in this. Uh, we have a housing project in Antwerp uh, with students uh, who, who then start um, having a house and the rent they pay comes back into parts of ownership of this house. So, so they're not losing the rent entirely. They're building up from the first day they start um, living there uh, and and so it gives them a way a transparent way to to go there and then we have uh, social projects um, um with a with a bathhouse in in france uh, as well that that we are uh, mixing uh, really co-living co uh, spaces and, and really social projects 
with, with something to make it sustainable. So, so there are a couple of initiatives we're trying out. And, and in the EU, I'm, I'm fairly certain we can, we can really launch uh, more things because the legal frame starts to be there. Um, but, but on a technical side, for example, we're very much looking at what's, what's being done uh, around and, and where we can uh, uh, really pick, pick on because, because it's, it's a huge amount of things to develop uh, otherwise. And there are very, very interesting initiatives. And, and since I'm very open about whatever we produce is not ours, so, so it's all open source. And, and I'm, uh, I'm, I'm really looking forward to, um, I've already, already noted uh, during the conference a couple of very interesting projects. We, we need to reach out and, and see how we can work together on bringing it all together. I would say encourage encourage both of you uh, be in touch. There's a lot of interested people in the audience. We're getting great questions. Unfortunately, uh, we are out of time. Uh, I think that's the sign of a good conversation where you lose track of of, of what of like the the amount of questions, the amount of great kind of uh, interactions. And I feel like we all have a lot in common. We could talk about for hours after this. Um, thank you both so much. Thank you for those who tuned in. Again, for those who stayed up late or woke up early to kind of um, get your creative juices flowing. Um, really appreciate, appreciate the conversation with both of you. Again, I feel like we could talk for a while about our kind of different sense of ownership that we've had in our, in our careers. Hopefully I'll make it over from London to either Antwerp or, or Berlin soon. Uh, thank you all so much. Um, you know, be in touch and, and have a great one. Thank you everyone for tuning yeah, in. Thanks guys, see you, see you on Twitter. Thank you. Yeah.